Welcome to Sober Doc Coffee, a weekly coffee chat sharing experience, strength, and hope for anyone on the sober road to recovery. You can download Sober Doc Coffee weekly on all podcast platforms and check us out on Instagram at Sober Doc Coffee Podcast and on Twitter at Sober Coffee Pod. To learn more about us and to help support these sessions, visit online at Sober Doc Coffee. Here are your hosts, two guys on their own path to recovery, Mike and Glenn. Let's join them at the coffee shop. Hey, good morning, Glenn. Morning, brother. How are you doing this morning? You know, wonderful. This never gets old. This never gets old. I mean, just getting together, talking about recovery and, and uh, sharing a little bit of hope, you know? Yeah, I love uh, it. Plus the coffee. Coffee's always great. And then this morning, you know, I just mentioned in, in two words, I said, hey, yeah, I'm going to start watching what I'm eating. And then they bring out the, <laughs> bring out the donuts. <laughs> the bag of donuts. And so I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's, that's what, awesome. That's how this stuff works, right? That's right. What's the line after the holidays, <laughs> right? That's great, man. Yeah. So, yeah, it's so great what are we to doing be here. Today? Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna kind of hand it over to you. You've got uh, you've got there a you guest go. that we're gonna we have. So we got a table for three today. Table for the corner table for three. I, I love, love it. it. I love I it. I love it. Three. Yeah, that's awesome. So let let me build a little backstory here. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Matt. Matt, hey, great to have you on the phone with us, man. Hey, Matt. Hi, guys. Welcome to or thanks for having me here. Excited to be here and be a part of this uh, this program that you guys are are, are doing here. So. I'm on board. Yeah, All really right, cool. Beautiful. Thanks, man. Thank, thanks for getting up uh, super early. It's a little bit behind the counter. We, we do these super early in the morning. So I was just joking, Matt. He's probably on his third REM stage, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, Matt, thanks a lot for jumping in. So, yeah. So here's what we like to do today, um, you know, as, as I start to un- unpack this. So we're on a couple social media fronts. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Uh, on, on Instagram, we're sober.coffeepodcast. Uh, and on uh, Twitter, we're Sober uh, Coffee Pod, okay? So mm-hmm. folks love to interact with us, right? They, they come in, they, they say, Glenn, you know, we're sick and tired of hearing you clearing your throat. Um, <laughs> Mikey's awesome. How can I have Mikey over for Christmas? It's all, all that kind of stuff. But, that, and that's just my mom, Matt. <laughs> she, the only right. way she, she really communicates with me is through the show, yeah. Yeah, she, she's our well, number one she listener. Well, at least she is. Yeah, right, she right. Is. She, she's without a doubt our, our, our number one listener. But so, but we also get a lot of questions, right? And, mm-hmm. and not only from the podcast, but in the rooms, right? We get a lot mm-hmm. of questions about treatment. So when, when we were, you know, and, and Mikey's got experience in treatment, and sure enough, so do I, right? But... You know, instead of just talking, you know, from our experience again, which we've already shared, what we like to do is bring an expert in the room, right? And so, Matt, that's why we invited you. However, I have to intro Matt. Okay, go. Right, because this is this is not just a, a guest that we pulled from the phone book. I don't think they have phone books anymore, right? But, <laughs> What's a phone book? <laughs> no, totally. But is, Matt is not a guest that we pulled from the phone book. So as I've told and shared my story... Uh, in September of 2014, you know, I relapsed yet again. I had met Matt earlier in 2014, and we were building a plan and you know, to get to a sober living and to get out of the situation I was in and blah, blah, right? So I go to a conference 2014. It's out in Palm Springs, and I relapse on my way out there. So long story short, within in that one week, I was like six different hospitals in that one week. I landed up in an eight-day detox. And on a Friday afternoon, I landed up sitting on the floor of Matt's office. So Matt was my counselor that I surrendered to. And I can remember Matt asking me, he says, Glenn, do you have any hope? Because I was at ground zero at that point. And I said, yes, I do. And he goes, well, that's great. And I said, Matt, he said, I will do whatever you tell me to do, man. I just can't take another drink. Um... And, and I really meant it then, and I meant it now. Um, and, and I stay connected with Matt along the way. He's been a real brother, just a real lighthouse for me as I go through my, uh, on, on my sober path. He has helped so many people that I've been connected with. Um, Matt is executive director of the Care Addiction Center in Geneva, Illinois. Can I, can I interject? Absolutely, you can. Yeah. So is it safe to say uh, and, and not overstate um, what he did is, is it was integral in saving your life? So, yes. Okay. And, and I've shared that with him many times, and Matt's humble, and he's like, man, no, no, you know. But 
my experience as we talk about treatment, we can chime in and, you know, as, as Matt rolls it out. But I'd had a lot of experience in treatment mm-hmm. and with counselors and with doctors and all kinds of programs, mm-hmm. right? Um, I was in a 45-day day hospital program, and, and so I, I had experience, right? So I can say this unequivocally is that Matt, Matt had a level of connection, care, not to use the pun of care mm-hmm. addiction center, but care, mm-hmm. right, empathy, and, and he had tools that he used with me that were extremely effective and continue to be because I continue to take guidance from him. Well, here's so here's, wow. Was that an intro or what? Yeah. Well, and here's the pile on. <laughs> so Matt, um, I don't know you personally, but uh, I want to thank you for being part of saving my life because years after Glenn's floor experience, I walked into a room um, unsure that there was hope for me, and um, and I I listened to a story of hope that Glenn shared, and uh, we hit it off right away. And I said, I want what that guy has. Well, mm-hmm. that guy got what he got on the floor of your counseling room. And so I owe you a big thank you. We're in a serious business here of, um, you know, staying sober keeps us alive. So thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. So let's stop Pat and Matt on the back. All right. right? Yeah. Well, let's, let's stop. <laughs> it's, not, but, it's not all that yeah, good. But, but, but I, I will say this. Um, his commitment to uh, folks... Uh, seeking searching sobriety Mm -hmm. and on the path of sobriety uh i mean it's it's relentless and and i rarely use that word because it does mean a lot uh but it's relentless so matt with that said welcome (laughs) welcome welcome i would i'd say that's uh that's quite quite the intro so i i appreciate the kind words and and also i i want to point out that uh you know no one does this alone right it takes a it takes a village sometimes to, to get us to where we need to be. So uh, what whatever small role I may or may have not played in, in uh, anyone's recovery, the hard work is always done by the patient. Mm-hmm. So I want to make that distinction. Uh, you know, we're, we're just the stewards of treatment at that time. So, and Matt, that's great. Yeah. We really value that. So, so let's dig into treatment, right? So you, you're an expert in treatment. I mean, it's, you know, it's what you do. Um, so let's outline for folks the, like, like different levels of treatment, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and I, four come to mind for me. One is detox. Uh, two is residential. Uh, three is, uh, the, the three letters IOP. Mm-hmm. Uh, and four is sober living, right? And then, and then you know, there's probably some that, that I'm not aware of. So what, what I thought we'd do is just chat through what, the, what they are, you know, what it looks like, what people do in each one of them, kind of what the expectations sure. are. You know, and then if, if you could, you know, and, you know, towards the end, just talk about doing an assessment, right? What does that look like? How do people, if they're trying to figure this out, right, uh, what's a good next step for them? Absolutely, guys. Yeah. And it, I'm sure you're getting a lot of interest and kind of a lot of calls of, you know, I want to get into treatment. I know I have to stop, uh, whether it's alcohol or a su- substance, you know, what do I do? What's that first step kind of look like? So I think it can be kind of difficult to navigate. So if I can provide any kind of insight or perspective of, of what these different levels look like, I'm, I'm happy to and awesome. obviously clarify anything. So to the, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine is who we use as far as our different levels of care. To do the whole, let's say the full gamut here of the different levels of care, let's start at the highest. That'd be a medical detox. That's the highest level of treatment uh, that, that's offered. The step below that would be an inpatient. Um, inpatient is uh, synonymous with residential, same program. Step below that, would be a PHP or a day program. PHP is a partial hospitalization program. Step below that would be an intensive outpatient program. Step below that is just a traditional outpatient program. A step below that would just be individual counseling or even perhaps an aftercare program. So there's a wide array of different levels of care kind of based upon that assessment that you're going to do, you know, when you finally seek services. So I'll start with the the detox. So traditionally that's done uh, outside of a hospital, traditionally at a uh, 
a, a treatment center that offers medical detox. Um, typically, it takes about seven days to get through a, a medical detox. Uh, again, it's going to depend on uh, the individual. It's going to depend on what substances were used over what duration. Um, also, there's any kind of medical issues going on there. Um, you know, that it, it, it'll all kind of be determined upon that. Um, there is also something else that I think less folks are aware of, which is called an ambulatory detox. So uh, if you aren't able to, let's say, go into an in, or a uh, detox for a week or five days or whatever it may be, some doctors, we work with a doctor uh, over in Lyle, you know, who does a lot of our uh, ambulatory detox. Mm -hmm. Ambulatory detox simply means detoxing at home. Uh, you, mm. you know, you're, you're working with a doctor, uh, you know, licensed medical professionals to be able to, you know, uh, get through some of these withdrawal symptoms comfortably at home. Uh, my, my disclaimer for all of your listeners out there, uh, I think some folks like to just say cold turkey, I'm done and give up. Uh, I want to start this new life. And the withdrawals from a few substances like alcohol uh, some benzodiazepines can be fatal in their withdrawal. So we need to be very careful in how we go about that. So I would absolutely kind of, you know, want to speak to a, a medical professional or at mm -hmm. least a treatment center and get some, uh, some guidance on how to do that safely. You know, one of the, cha one of the challenges I know having gone through this um, was when I went in, of course they, there was a litany of questions, you know, what are you, what are you on? What are you using? How, what's your intake? How much, how often? And mm -hmm. of course, what came out of my mouth was nothing but lies. Right. And, <laughs> sure. you know, oh, so geez. how they, you know, how are they going to treat me on that? But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, so, so how do you, how do you gauge for, cause for me, I thought it was an overshoot even to be in the hospital, but I know I, I was close enough to stories within my family where people had actually stroked out, just mm -hmm. trying to come off of alcohol on their own. So that's why I went the hospital route. But um, how, how does one know that, that the hospital route is the, is the right way or, or this medical detox is, is the right way for them just getting medical advice? That's an excellent question. Excellent question. I would refer or deter to, hey, let's see a medical professional. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a counselor at a substance abuse uh, facility like ourselves, mm -hmm. or if it's going to the ER, mm -hmm. but having medical eyes on you to provide that medical recommendation, because unless, well, even if you did have your MD, mm -hmm. you know, you'd still want to have a second opinion. There. Sure. Okay. So, Excellent. And, to, and to speak to your honesty piece of it, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, when someone comes in to do an assessment, we take them at what their word is, you know. So if, if you're coming in, there's no point in, in minimizing. There's mm -hmm. no point in kind of rationalizing what this is. Right. You're hopefully at a, at a point in your life where you have had, you're, you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sure, right, right. What, what do I got to do? How, do? how do I do this safely? How do I get to this next step? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that's kind of how the detox part of this, this works. Obviously... Uh, I'm sure uh, folks are aware that detox basically is just addressing the physical side of addiction, not the psychological side of addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, what we have all found is addressing the physical first, then we're able to kind of work on the psychological. So, right, right, just, and that so that goes in, hand in hand with the the big book uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they talk about that's the first thing they do is address. And, and oftentimes in the first uh, 20, 30 pages, they, they talk about mm -hmm. make, making sure the physical is in check before, before you conquer, you know, go to, go to conquer the big, bigger problem. Yeah, so, so Matt, why would somebody do the ambulatory instead of the kind of institutionalized the detox? Is it just convenience? Is it cost? Um, Support probably, system? Bo probably all three of those. You know, it would really kind of depend on the individual's history, their use, duration, acuity of, of symptoms. All that's going to be taken into account. Um, but I think a lot of folks don't know about that. Right. And I, I think a lot of folks see this, well, I got to go to detox. I'm going to be, you know, strapped down to a gurney and there, no one's going to let me out. And, you know, kind of uh, the, the old uh, Bill W. and, and uh, Dr. Bob 
uh, kind of ideas. And there's, there's, it's come a long way, um, you know, uh, as far as treating these symptoms. So it's up to that medical professional to kind of guide that individual based on that case of, hey, this would probably work well, or you could use this as an option too. Right. Nice. Okay. So once once healthy, then they then they move into one of these uh, the next steps, the inpatient or or day program, or it's, or it's like I thought so many times, back to work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. How'd that work out? Which for is you? the wrong answer. Right. <laughs> so more or less, uh, we want to get somebody that um, you know has has any kind of withdrawal symptoms medically stable. So whether that's a uh, two day stay or an ambulatory uh, procedure that's done, we wanna get to that baseline so we're able to kind of find out if there are any other symptoms going on. Uh, always the question is, you know, the chicken or the egg in, in this situation, it's well, is the mental health creating the substance abuse or is substance abuse creating mental health issues? Right. So once we get to a, a baseline of sobriety, then we can kind of readdress kind of what's going on psychologically with that client. So. Uh, as Glenn had mentioned earlier, completing that assessment or what we do is a, a biopsychosocial assessment. Um, once we complete Sounds that, complicated. Then we're able, <laughs> <laughs> once we're able to complete that, then we can make those clinical <clears throat> kind of recommendations. So the biopsychosocial, uh, I think that's pretty much the standard as far as the ACM or the American Society of Addiction Medicine calls for. Um, Basically, what it means is the, the biological, the sociological, and the psychological aspects of what's going on with that patient. So whether it's the, the bio, um, physical health, uh, any kind of medications, genetic vulnerabilities, we're going to look into all of those with that patient. The sociological perspective or the part of, of this assessment of being what peer support is there, what family circumstances are going on um interpersonal relationships uh any past trauma legal concerns are there any community supports are they already connected do they have any kind of support system and of course lastly psychological so what coping skills are in place now what are they utilizing to manage if there are cravings or triggers um do we have any of those kind of set up what's the self-concept what's the self-esteem gauge um, you know, are, and are there any mental health concerns? So it, this biopsychosocial gives us a really um, in-depth snapshot of a client. And from that, then we're able to kind of make that uh, recommendation of what uh, level of care would be most of, uh, effective and appropriate for them. So you're doing that right on the heels of detox. And, and then that's when you're going to make the recommendation as to what direction they should go. Correct. I've, I've done some assessments in the past. I can think of two off the top of my head where we were in the assessment and the individual, both of them, were experiencing shakes, uh, having a lot of difficulty concentrating, difficulty answering uh, questions. I, I will stop the assessment immediately and transport them or have them transported to a medical detox. Mm. A lot of times folks think, hey, I don't have to get into detox yet. Let me just let me do this on my own. Um, and it, it's not always a safe way to go. Right, right. Yeah, and just from listening to you, Matt, the way you outlined the biopsychosocial, um, I mean, to me, it sounds complicated, right? So, you know, the first thing I go to is, you know, for, for many of those stages I was at, I knew it all. You know, I, I was in the self-assessment stage. I could figure this out. Mm -hmm. And um, clearly from my own experience and from just listening to you, Get a get a professional involved, right? Get the get the professional who is not inside your own head, right? And and get some you know some real assessment going on of, of what's going on in total in, in all those areas. Absolutely, I, I can't echo that uh, enough because I think there is, you know, we th we think that we know what the best route is, and that I think sometimes arm uh, chair quarterbacking doesn't always pan out the way it should. When I've worked with families in the past, I, I've, I've done many times, uh, you know, a, a spouse or a parent calls and says, hey, you know, this loved one, 
you know, we're going to we're going to talk to him Saturday morning. We're all concerned. What what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to say? My number one advice always is you don't have to be the the burden of bad news here. Mm -hmm. Let them say, hey, why don't you see a professional? Maybe there isn't a problem. Maybe we're totally overreacting, but maybe there is a problem, too. And this is a, a trained, licensed professional. Let's let them figure that out. So I think that has yielded uh, the best outcomes as the family members are kind of taken out of it uh, and the professionals kind of step in to do what they're trained to do. Yeah, and in my case, I'm so glad that that tra you know, transpired. I went from detox and, yes, I was assessed in the hospital under care. And, and uh, I know that on the way out to my inpatient, uh, you know, I shared before, I, I told my wife, I, we were about halfway out there when I was kind of gaining, regaining or gaining for the first time consciousness. And, of course, I had seven days of sobriety under my belt because it's hard to get a drink in uh, intensive care in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, and so, I, you know, I felt I, I had good legs underneath me, and, and uh, I suggested that maybe I overshot this whole, you know, alcoholic <laughs> thing. And uh, she just nodded, but yet her 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 hand stayed on the wheel firmly, you know, pointed in the direction of a, of a rehab facility. Going west. Best best thing that ever happened to me. That assessment, obviously, I didn't know what was going on at the time, but they did, and they placed me in the in what I needed at the time. I just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Matt. So that's great. So so now what's uh, I think you said inpatient was next. Yeah, so inpatient is kind of that is kind of that next step below um, detox. As detox is the highest level of care, inpatient is kind of the next inpatient, or uh, some refer to it as residential. Um, so these are going to be facilities that are set up to house you. That's kind of the major difference between an inpatient or outpatient program. Typically, inpatient programs last around 28 days. Uh, based on progress, they can be extended. It's all kind of based upon, uh, you know, the progress being made and the needs that are uh, met and still have yet to be met, let's say. Uh, most of the time, it's, you know, highly, highly structured. Um, I used to work at a, a facility over where you guys are uh, in Juliet, mm -hmm. and, you know, there, there was a schedule from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m., mm -hmm. and kind of the the nice benefit of a inpatient program is your day is planned you're not going to have much time to uh do much else you know it's going to be incorporated with different lectures groups <clears throat> outings um new support systems in individual therapy uh it's highly highly structured obviously another uh, benefit of an inpatient program would be the, the 24-hour uh mental or uh, medical care staff that will mm -hmm. be there mm -hmm. so um some folks really enjoy that um some folks need that so it really kind of depends upon that um that assessment so higher level of care than outpatient obviously um most of the time you're going to have to figure out what you can do with your employer if you're allowed or able to get some time off if you have ch children how is that going to work as far as child care uh, if there's any other kind of responsibilities or accountabilities that need to be uh, fulfilled while you're away, um, those are definitely, I think, some sometimes barriers for folks getting yeah. into. I'm really inpatient. glad. I'm really glad you brought that up because what what is your you know what what is your kind of your go to response when somebody says How, you can't take me out of my loop for 28 days? I I've got I've got a job. I've got this. I've got that. How do you how do you kind of professionally address? their concerns i mean obviously you're you're making the recommendation on the best of their health um how do you how do you kind of compel them to to follow that course well i, I it's a great question uh, and it always doesn't go as planned right? no it doesn't <laughs> but uh, but i think being very honest uh and transparent this this is a life or death disease right and I am in the business of saving lives. That's why I'm here. I believe in this work. And I think I can, uh, most of the time, can compel folks to, hey, uh, understand maybe my way isn't working. And my thinking got me here. So maybe I need to change my perspective and try some different outlets here. Um, 
I think it's just having that transparency and an open dialogue. Most of the time, the reason they someone wasn't doesn't want to go is fear. Fear is the, the number one driver. Um, so if I can help settle any of that anxiety and kind of paint the picture of what this is really going to look like, uh, I, I think it reduces some of that. And, you know, we see a little bit more willingness to, okay, I'll give it a shot. Right. Yeah, and I've, I've worked with a lot of folks, and, you know, the minute you bring up, you know, treatment, right, that's where their brain kicks in gear that they know better. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, oh, I don't need that. You know, I'm not that bad. And, and, and then it's like, okay. And then two weeks later, you know, they're in detox again, you know. Sure. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Matt, you just outlined sometimes, you know, our best thinking got us here, right? And to extend that, you know, it's hard to, you know, fix a problem with the same brain that created it, mm-hmm. right? So that's where the outside influence. And, and to me, it comes down to surrender, you know, and, and specifically, you know, Matt, you laid stuff out for me and I, I didn't like it. I, you know, I'm like, but I surrendered. I'm like, okay, I need to do different things. I need to look at things differently. I need to take direction um, instead of trying to control everything. And that's when I started to see different results. Absolutely. And, and a lot of times I think this is a, a thinking disease. Once we get some other areas under control, it's a, it's a thinking disease. And I think there's a lot of different interventions and modalities that we use at Care Addiction Center that are quite helpful for folks. Um, we use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, didactic behavioral therapy, and mindfulness that I think once folks are in the program uh, and the guard somewhat comes down a little bit, we get a little vulnerable. You know, we start to see, hey, maybe there's some merit in this. Maybe, maybe things are changing. Uh, then that's when we can really see the light bulbs click. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's always an exciting and, and extremely uh, humbling experience to watch. Mm-hmm. So that would that was inpatient. Mm-hmm. So the next step below that would be outpatient. So to break outpatient uh, into the kind of sub levels here. So uh, the highest level of outpatient would be a PHP. That's that partial hospitalization program. More or less what that looks like is a, um, a day program. So you're going to, most hospitals offer a PHP program. Um, so typically at 8 to 3 p.m., um, you'll go in in the morning, you're going to have a group, you'll have a break for lunch, and then you're going to have another long group in the afternoon. Um, so obviously it's kind of that um, balance between a regular IOP group, which is a step below PHP, but not all the way inpatient where you're living there. PHP, you're still able to return home, uh, sleep in your own bed, uh, but again, you're gonna be gone for most of the day. Again, a highly structured uh, program focused on you know rehabilitation and kind of getting the skills and Counseling supports and- in place. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's the PHP. A step below PHP is that IOP, the intensive outpatient program. So typically that's that's a, a program that's gonna meet between nine and 18 hours per week, at least in the state of Illinois. Uh, that's the uh, regs and uh, regulation for what IOP is. It's uh, determined by the hours per week. So some programs may be three days a week, other programs may be five days a week, mm-hmm. um, but typically it's gonna be between that nine and 18 hours. With IOP, it's kind of a unique level of care um, IOP allows for three hours per day of treatment. Um, typically, it's in the in the evening. Some folks have it in the early morning. Um, you're still able to work a full time job. Um, you're still sleeping in your own bed at home. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, positives of IOP is that outside of uh, inpatient. You know, you're you're able to use these kind of skills and strategies that you're learning in real time. Mm. When we're in inpatient or residential, we're kind of in this in this extremely structured, safe environment where you know, obviously it's voluntary; you can leave at any time. But you know, the the stress levels and the day to day agitations aren't aren't as present. In an IOP program, you're able to 
So like I said, work in real time and see what coping skills work for these and what don't and readjust. So I think that's kind of a, one of the major benefits of an IOP program. It's a higher level of care um, and I think it works quite well. Uh, a step below IOP is just OP. So just regular outpatient programming. What really kind of determines that per state regs is it's six hours or, or less per week. So typically what that would look like would be uh, two days a week for three hours a day. Um, some programs run it one day a week for three hours. Um, it really kind of depends on how their program is structured and set up. Still gonna receive counseling, but less supervision, uh, less, uh, less services, let's say. Um, typically, we, what we want is for our clients to come in and kind of walk the continuum of care, as we call it. You know, if they're starting off on um, detox, get them all the way down through OP. Uh, the longer the services, the longer the supports are in place, mm -hmm. the better the outcomes of sobriety. So I want to make that point as well. Yeah, it was, it's interesting to bring that up. I was going to ask uh, if, if, from your experience, <laughs> is it... Um, is there a higher degree of, of uh, recovery rates, permanent recovery rates uh, for those that, that take those steps and, and follow that logical uh, progression from good, good inpatient question. to day to, you know, is there a statistic, is it, is it, do the statistics back it up? I think um, anywhere that you would look, whether it, it was with ASAM or NIDA, um, I think most would show the longer someone's in treatment, regardless of level of care, mm -hmm. the longer their sobriety yields. Okay, great. That's encouraging. Yeah, and Matt, I want to pick up when, when you were talking about, um, you know, when you're talking about the uh, outpatient, you know, either the PHP or IOP. And, you know, I, I called it the live and learn, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, or, or I'm sorry, learn and live. Mm -hmm. So you're in their IOP group settings. You have counselors really bringing some new content. You're able to tear it apart. You're able to talk about it. And then that next day, you're able to go out and live it. Right. You know, um, so very, very effective. And, and what, what, what I felt when I did my numerous inpatients is I had, you know, obviously fires, forest fires going on around me in my life. I mean, every area of my life was burning down. And, and it gave me a chance to get out of that, you know, environment of, of a burning hot forest fire and into a safe zone where I could just get a pause and I could start to get some, some input instead of people screaming at me because of what I was putting them through and what I was putting myself through. Now I was able to get some, you know, some love coming my way and say, hey, there's a solution. And, and it, so those worked for me, right? right? Um, you know, but that's the importance of the assessment is, you know, with a professional is they can help guide and understand what you're going through to point you in the right direction. Right. Right, right Matt? Yep. One hundred percent. And, you know, I, I think everyone is on their own timeline. And I think until we're able to kind of, as you had said, surrender and make have have some acceptance of hey this is what i have to do and i'm willing to do whatever i need to do to have this sober life i'm i i don't want to lose my wife i don't want to lose this job i don't want to impact my children whatever that natural consequence of addiction is i don't want it to occur until we get to that kind of stage you know i think there there can be a lot of loose traction um but i think when when we're ready uh, and have that opportunity things amazing things and miracles occur mm -hmm. yeah that's great matt and then can can you touch a little bit i know our time's getting short here but can you touch a little bit on about uh sober living sure so there's a there's a few different types of sober living here so obviously um sober living of, of what it is uh a structured environment you know where uh most of the time sober livings are privately owned um they're not owned by uh, corporations or treatment centers, typically they're, they're owned independently. Um, one of the unique thing with sober living houses um, are there aren't normally time restrictions on them. Mm -hmm. If you go into a halfway house, there's, there's probably a time restriction of how long you're able to remain in the house. Um, I think most of the time those are owned by the, the state or some form of government. 
and they need to be able to offer that bed at some point to somebody else. You know, in a sober living house, you can, you know, continue that for long periods of time. I think that's an important distinction uh, to, to make. Obviously, uh, both are going to be centered around, you know, helping you figure out this next stage of, I got out of treatment, now I, I need that sober living piece to further my accountability. Uh, so both are definitely going to be centered on that. Some may require you to have employment or be out of the house from, you know, nine to three, mm -hmm. whether that's looking for a job or volunteering. Um, some some may require that, uh, whereas others don't. Uh, most of the time, another distinction between um, sober living in a halfway house, halfway houses almost always require that you're recently discharged from a treatment center or you're actively involved in a treatment center. A sober living house, you don't have to come from a treatment center. You could go in and just say, hey, I wanna work on this sobriety thing. Uh, I, I, I can't be at home uh, and, and move in there and, and receive some support services and probably some counseling services uh, as well. Uh, they're just kind of two different avenues to go down, two different kind of uh, approaches. Okay, great. Hey, question for you. <clears throat> I'm a listener, uh, or or I'm me, uh, just a few months back, right? Um, what are what are three things I should consider if if I think I'm I'm at that point? I know mentally I'm at that point. I know that that I'm moving toward closer to death than I am to life, and and I know that a change has to happen. But I'm very afraid because you you nailed it. It was fear that paralyzed me. What what can you give me three things that somebody should consider in the next 24 48 hours or three action items maybe go to this website do some research place a call to a professional what what are three action items somebody can if they really think they're at that point that they need to make a, a drastic change absolutely so i think number one talk to talk to a loved one mm -hmm. you know whether that's a spouse parent a close friend um, you know, someone at church, whoever that may be, talk to them, get the conversation started of, Hey, you know what? I, uh, I've been drinking more than I should. And I'm kind of getting concerned of what that's going to look like when I, when I stop, uh, get the conversation started. Let somebody outside of yourself, outside of your head know, Hey, uh, I'm concerned about this. Mm -hmm. I think that's step one right. for able to begin to accept hey, maybe I have to do something. Maybe there is a problem here. That's that's the that's the starting line. That's where we got to begin. We can't go anywhere if we're not at the starting line. Uh, secondly, I think after talking with somebody, um, and if, if it's a good idea or they're ready to kind of take that step to talk to a trained professional, make the call. There are uh, a lot of different resources online. Uh, one of my uh, favorites is Psychology Today. Um, so you can go on Psychology Today. It's free. You type in your zip code, your um, your town. You can search for therapists, treatment centers, eating disorder programs, hospitals that do detox, um, and get all of those right there. That's great. This is very valuable. Mm -hmm. So I use that as a professional, too. Just to, if, if I'm not sure of an area, I can go on there. Everybody on Psychology Today has been vetted as well. So you, you know you're getting trustworthy, licensed, accredited facilities. Great resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, at what point do we pick up the phone and call you or your center? So at Care Addiction Center, we take calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so we're a very small private practice. Uh, we offer all outpatient levels of care. We work with some different providers that offer higher levels of care and have uh, linkage agreements with them that we've worked with for for decades, uh, so we're, we're able to assist folks whatever need uh, they have. Um, if they call, typically I can, I do all of our assessments here at Care Addiction, uh, so typically I can get folks in either that day or the next. Um, as I said, 24 hours a day someone can call. Um, there, there's never an answering machine, you'll always get me. Um, I believe in this work and I believe that you can't miss a call as it can take a lot of courage uh, and, and to make that first call. To make that first call. Yeah. Is it okay once to... you do it, 
it yeah. gets easier. Is it okay to post your number on our website? Absolutely. Excellent. Of course. <clears throat> Man, that's great, Matt. You know what? Again, we get a lot of questions and um, – you know, really appreciate you jumping on today. First of all, I, I appreciate you you playing the role that, that you play in my life, man. It's just super critical, and I love your brother for that. And uh, thanks a lot for jumping on in our um, our corner table for three at the uh, Sober Die Coffee uh, coffee shop and just uh, breaking down that treatment. Kind of, there, there's a lot of mystique in there. There's a lot no, of and you demystified it. Yeah, de- de- demystified it, and and there's a lot of war stories that you hear in the room that. That's not true, right? So a lot mm-hmm. of misinformation is right. being passed around. And, you know, so, man, just really love you and appreciate you coming on here and, and love your mission. And, you know, there's a lot of people that I know that have great relationships with today that have been impacted by you and care, man. So thanks a lot for taking the time this early in the morning, especially. Yeah, thanks, Matt. We'll- hey, I, appre- I appreciate it. It was a pleasure talking with both you guys. And, again, the the mission that you guys are, are carrying out here by – by uh, reducing the stigma of addiction and providing your listeners with some resources, some education. There may be some listeners that this is the only kind of insight that they get and the mm. pr- perspective that they get. So you, you guys are doing a, a extremely noble and, and powerful work. So I want to thank both of you. Well, we uh, just do it for the coffee, Matt. So <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> And the donuts, of course. <laughs> and donuts. There you go. All right, man. Thanks All right, brother. so much. Thanks a lot, man. All right. You have hey, a great day. It was great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us for today's Coffee Chat. To contact the show, email us at podcast at sober.coffee. If you need immediate help, the AA hotline is 800-839-1686. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 800-800. 273-8255. Remember, Mike and Glenn are sharing their own journey on the path to recovery. Any suggestions, medical or otherwise, are their own experiences and should not be viewed as professional advice. See you next week, and remember, there is a solution. Stay safe in the city of Chicago.